thank you everyone for joining us today for our educational series. Uh, we're going to get started here in just one minute at the top of the hour. I want to allow some time for everyone to join us from the lobby. I always feel like this is a spot that we need music, right? You know, so it's not just quiet why everybody's coming in. <laughs> I was like, what is the webinar version of elevator music? <laughs> Let's see. Are you presenting your screen? Um, yes, it should be showing. It says, uh, do you not see, do you see the NRHA housekeeping? I no. do not see the screen right now. Um, bear with me. Yeah, no problem. No big deal. I was like, it was working a minute ago. It was. I saw it. <laughs> I'll tell you what. I'll go ahead and start um, welcoming everybody, uh, and then we'll turn it over to you, Opal, as soon as you get your screen up. So again, everyone, thank showing? you. So much for no, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, is it is it still not showing? Because I it says it it's unpaused on my end. It is not. Um, if you hit in the panel, if you hit the down arrow, it might be frozen. Um, Thank you, everybody, as we work through just a little bit of technical difficulties. Um, I'll let Opal get that up. I just want to welcome you all. Perfect. We can see it now. So welcome, everybody, to the National Rural Health Executive Educational Series. I am Cody Smith, the Partnership Manager with NRHA Services Corporation, and I will serve as your moderator for today's presentation. Before we dive in, I do want to note that there's a short survey at the end of this session, um, and your feedback is so invaluable in helping us to refine and tailor our future educational series to best serve your needs. So if you could take a minute after that webinar and fill that out, we would so appreciate it. Um, also like to review a few housekeeping items. All attendees are muted during the session to avoid background noise. We do aim to wrap up the presentation in 45 minutes or so, followed by a Q&A session. So if you have a question for Opal, please type it into the questions section of the webinar control panel and we will address it at the end. Um, I'd also like to remind you all that the event is being recorded and you will receive an email with a link to the recording later today. So today we have the privilege of hearing from Opal Greenway, principal with Stroudwater Associates, as she presents the first ever rural physician and advanced practice provider compensation survey. But before we begin, I do want to extend our sincere thanks to our dedicated partner, Stroudwater Associates. We are grateful for your continued support and industry expertise, which allows us to host conferences, educational webinars, and other events dedicated to improving rural health care. Your support is crucial to our mission of advancing rural health initiatives. And not only do our partners share their knowledge and expertise with us, but they play a very significant role in supporting NRHA's efforts on Capitol Hill. Their advocacy and support are essential to our ability to influence policy and secure funding for rural health care programs. So once again, we thank Stroudwater Associates for their ongoing support. We are so honored to have you as a partner in our mission to improve rural health care. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Opal for our feature presentation. Thanks, Cody, and thanks everyone for joining us today. For those of you who joined us in person in Kansas City the other week, it was great to see you. We had great conversation when we first presented the results of this survey, and but I am happy to share it with those of you via web today, and also to let you guys know that we will be able, the survey will be available for download um, shortly after we do all of these different presentations, and there will also be regional presentations to the different NOSOR um, regions with regards to your specific regional data and what um, what the results were. So given that we have a short time today together, I want to go over setting the stage for this survey. We want to talk about what's going on in the current compensation market because I really think that sets up the why as to what was the purpose behind this survey. What are the compensation packages that we're seeing out there right now amongst providers? And then we're going to dig into the survey itself talk about the findings. A lot of the findings we're gonna focus on today are about primary care based off of our results, but a little bit of a preview of what we've seen in specialty care and what's to come with the survey in the future, because we are planning on this being an annual survey. The feedback got so far in person was fantastic and clearly we're hitting a need that a lot of people want this information. So setting up the why, talking about our current compensation market, we recognize that provider compensation has had a lot of different forces that have been driving it over the past few years. We have things that have been driving compensation up significantly. We have a significant economic thing going on between supply and demand. Supply, we've had a lot of 
um, providers retire, exit practice, move into other areas of care rather than direct patient care. So our supply has been dwindling and it hasn't been dwindling just in the physician side of things. It's been dwindling also in the advanced practice provider space. So your nurse practitioners, your PAs, CRNAs, midwives, those have also been dwindling as demand has been rising. And part of that actually is that supply has been constrained by the fact that we actually are more concerned about it now than ever because we've seen people dropping out of the education space. So we don't have the same people to be able to create the new flow of providers into our systems and into our healthcare areas. So that's, you know, this shortage is only gonna get worse, which when there's a lot of demand and not enough supply, costs go up. So we've seen compensation go up. Obviously COVID-19 has had a significant impact on that. Everything is more expensive, including providers, um, to be able to get access to them. And then, I mean, there was a lot of burnout that went up. I'm gonna go over a little bit the change that there was some significant changes to the CMS physician fee schedule that has impacted compensation, especially in the primary care space. And rural is starting to feel the experience of that. There's also been an over-reliance on surveys. And when I say that, people have been using surveys a little bit inappropriately in setting their compensation historically. A lot of times people have the attitude of, well, as long as I provide median compensation as reported by some survey, then that is appropriate. Well, what happens when everybody pays median, you know, that then ends up becoming the floor, right? So the 10th percentile goes away and now median becomes the floor and people are offering greater than median. And so our averages go up and so prices overall go up. Of course, there are some downward pressures. It's called no CFO do I know at any rural hospital has a printing press to just print out more money. Um, there is that scarcity of resources. There's only so much funds. The CARES funding is gone. We're not getting another check um, of CARES fund to be able to keep providers whole the way we were during the pandemic. So we're going to have to change how we compensate providers and make sure we're in a good alignment when the money, when the money is running out to not have unlimited ability to pay compensation. And on top of that, we were technically always supposed to be paying providers in consistent with fair market value. That is part of the, part of the Stark and anti-kickback laws, that part of the, any of us who are taking Medicare or Medicaid funds um, and re reimbursement, we have to be paying within fair market value to any, but any provider that we have a financial relationship with. That's both the employed, and the PSAs. If we have a professional services agreement with an independent, it always needed to be within fair market value. Um, and there's been different applications of that as how much we've seen from a compliance standpoint. There have been some neutral um, things that have happened. A lot of people were curious in the past as to the move to value-based care, whether or not, what would that do to the overall cost of care when it comes to provider compensation? So far over the years, we've seen that have a very neutral impact. Be moving your compensation model over to something that reflects value-based care and value-based reimbursement and passing on that risk to providers or potential upside to providers if you're in a shared savings model has been something that actually hasn't driven compensation up, right? It's something that it's really about aligning providers and your compensation with the um, which what is driving your revenue. And then there's been some stark law changes that have allowed us some flexibility, and that also has had a neutral impact overall in compensation. In rural specifically, our lack of access to specialists and difficulty in recruiting. And what I would add to this is our lack of data. Our lack of inf data to be able to make informed decision making has greatly actually caused us to have significant upward pressures in overall compensation. Because if we're not able to educate our providers and educate ourselves as to what is an appropriate compensation package for a provider, then we have a tendency of flying blind and paying whatever we think is market um, market amounts or whatever somebody tells us here's what it takes for me to come and work in your community and so we write that check and a compensation continues to go up now i want to talk about the limitations to survey data because that is very much driven why did we want to do this survey to begin with so the largest survey out there right now historically has been medical group medical group management associates Many of you might have heard of it as MGMA. MGMA is a fantastic resource out there. They have this huge survey, over 200 questions, takes at least four hours to complete if you have all the data at your fingertips to talk about here's the compensation that we're seeing in practices and our productivity. And the problem though with the MGMA data is they haven't been targeted towards rural providers. There's not very many respondents for them. And so when we look at MGMA, we pulled, okay, which of MGMA have each specialty 
that they have that has at least 50 providers represented. And as you can see, there's not very many specialties that actually MGMA is getting a ton of data on with regards to representing at least 50 providers. So I have a little screenshot on here of showing the MGMA data of just here are some specialties that MGMA has it with at least 50 providers where they are able to report here's what median compensation is. So you're seeing there's primary care, nurse practitioner, family medicine, family medicine doctors, pediatricians, OBGYN, we have some general surgery and hospitalists, but you know that's about it. And when we look at this, the group count, that's the total number of organizations that have responded to this, to MGMA survey. And the count is the number of providers represented in those organizations. And so on the high end, Family Medicine Without OB, we had 115 organizations actually provide data that says, hey, I'm a rural organization, and I'm going to say, here's how much I pay for um, my providers. On top of that, MGMA has very, very specific definitions as to what it includes in its survey data. And what it includes, which is consistent with the Stark rules, is talking about total cash compensation for professional services. So whether that's W-2 or K-1 compensation, it's supposed to be all-inclusive. Unfortunately, because not every organization gets full access to the data, or and oftentimes what we see is in an organization is somebody will come out with a you know a print off of a PDF from the survey and say all right here's what compensation is without all the background information oftentimes we're seeing organizations interpret this as saying oh this is base compensation this is what I have to give you as a salary forget any medical director stipend or an AP or supervision for hey I have you are a physician and you're recruit or you're supervising four different nurse practitioners here's the stipend for that oh i'm giving you excess call compensation you're a medical director or you may even enroll we oftentimes have our cmo is some a physician who's also working full time realistically the data that they provide is supposed to be total cash compensation not base salary i was just working in an organization in wisconsin where the nurse practitioners were startled when they saw the mgma data and they said that's not us are we've been those base salaries are a lot lower than anything that we've seen in the market um, for nurse practitioners and we compared it to the state level data for all of the government owned um, hospitals and it was the mgma data did not necessarily line up for that specific specialty so when we look at this, the total number of primary care providers that are reflected in the MGMA data is only about a thousand providers. When you think about how big rural is and across the market, and that's not a ton of information. And we're, so we look at this data and we realize we're comparing ourselves to academic medical centers. We're comparing ourselves to urban areas and large tertiary hospitals. And that's not always reflective of what our experience is in rural. And one of the big limitations in that compensation that we're seeing is it doesn't take into consideration the scope of the services that we're providing in rural. It doesn't take into consideration that our family medicine providers are doing a whole host of services due to a lack of access to specialists than a family medicine provider who I live south of Nashville, Tennessee, that might be you know within the practice that I go to, right? My, my um, family medicine provider, has a whole list of other people within her medical group that she can actually send me to if I need an ENT, if I need GI, if I need any of those things. Where I grew up in Idaho, that was not the case. My doctor saw you for absolutely everything. Even back then, we called them general practitioners. And it, and it was reflective of the scope of care that he was providing. So these limitations to survey was part of where we partnered with NRHA and we said, we've got to do something about this. Rural needs to be able to have informed decision making. So with that being said, I want to set, set the groundwork of a little bit of when I talk about compensation, what am I talking about? Like what is included in that, especially given the misconception that compensation is just base salary, right? When we see it nationally, what we see is that actually 72% of compensation models are salary with some sort of bonus. There's an incentive payment in there. Usually it's productivity incentives, right? Some sort of metric that can be measured, shared with the providers on a regular basis. The number one that we see is work RVUs. It's set by CMS what the work RVU is for each CPT code. So productivity based, on, based off of work RVUs is the most common. And it's usually an upside basis. Here's your base salary. And on top of your base salary, if you hit a certain threshold of work RVUs, you get an extra amount for every work RVU after that. 
right. In primary care, we also see people paying incentives on encounters or panel size, especially those who are further along value-based payments, they might pay on value-based. Once upon a time, we did see a lot of people paying on as a percentage of net professional collections. That has typically gone away. It definitely does not work for not-for-profit organizations. It's a, it's a very bad model for anybody who works in an emergency department or on the hospitalist side with EMTALA roles and making sure that you're consistent with your missions or, or your organization's mission. We have seen a lot of organizations and a huge increase in how many organizations are paying quality compensation. You'll see in here, in even in 2020, 64% of organizations were putting quality compensation within the metrics that they were using. Now, I will say this is consistent with what we typically see of, of what physicians are expecting, right? When they graduate from residency, this is consistent with the education I'm seeing them come out with of what they're thinking that they're going to see in their offer. But we did this survey and it's going to, and I'll get to what the results are as far as how is this translated into rural, right? Oftentimes you will also see organizations pay for call compensation, especially in rural, given our high call burden. People don't like to be on call 24-7, 365, and it's difficult enough to get somebody to do one and two. And it's very expensive to have somebody do one and three because oftentimes we don't have the level of volumes maybe to support three general surgeons or three orthopedic surgeons and keep them busy enough to have a financial return for the organization. We also see a lot of people pay medical directorships. Now, one of the things I must point out about medical directorships is the current median level medical directorship that we're seeing is some sort of stipend, whether it's an annual stipend of $25,000 a year or an hourly rate with so many, um, up to so many hours per month, like typically 20 hours per month. But one of the things that we had been seeing anecdotally in rural was a lot of organizations having multiple people with medical directorships, even within the same specialty. And, you know, so I have to put that out there that medical directorships are supposed to have a very specific job and duties that they are doing to um, constitute that pay as to why am I paying them this administrative pay Here's what it's for, here's how much it is, and here's how these things tie together, as opposed to you get a medical directorship and you get a medical directorship. And I had one organization that had so many medical directorships, they were they had an inside joke of, I feel like we have a medical directorship over parking. Um, and that's, you know, it was because they had gotten into a practice of basically any physician got at least a ten thousand dollar medical directorship regardless. And it was a way to increase compensation have to say, don't do that, please. It's, um, there's compliance problems with doing that. Now, with that, I have to mention something with regards to this survey about advanced practice providers. One of the things that we've been seeing in increasing things, okay, physicians actually getting paid some sort of compensation for supervising their APPs. Whether or not they're supervising their APPs and they're getting, here's a stipend of $2,500 per advanced practice provider, or they're actually having the APP contribute to their incentive compensation, such as the physician getting credit for a portion of it, the advanced practice providers work RVUs that they generate, and the physician gets that credited towards their productivity bonuses. And so it's really interesting what we've seen as far as what the provider compensation has been for that APP collaboration, and how in the survey actually will reflect how is it distinctive based off of what an APP can do in that specific state. What are the restrictions? The more freedom that an APP has to practice at the top of their license, the more pay that they get. And you, we would expect to see the less pay that the physician, physician would get for supervising them because they shouldn't need as much supervision. So we'll get into that in the results. The other thing is, is that I thought was crucial about this survey was we are seeing advanced practice providers, especially nurse practitioners, start to get paid a lot more like physicians, right? Their work aligns with the work that they do with the physicians. They are acting in primary care. A lot of them have their own patient panel. And so they're getting paid the same way as a physician, not the same amount of money, but the same type of compensation. As opposed to if I rewind the clock 15 years, what I was typically seeing is a nurse practitioner was paid an hourly rate similar to a registered nurse, right? A higher amount, but in that same vein. And so we're now starting to see advanced practice providers mimic physician compensation. They're getting sign-on bonuses. They're getting relocation assistance. They're getting CME support. Even there, a lot of them are becoming medical directors um, in rural organizations. And so needing to understand, I'm not going to compare my compensation for my nurse practitioner of being 
what's the RN rate and giving that a bump, I really need to understand what is the compensation for a nurse practitioner. So let's get into the survey. All right, when we did this survey, like I said, the point was to make sure we got good data from rural respondents. We limited it specifically to rural respondents. There was respondents that had no more than 150 staffed beds. You could be part of a system affiliate or you could be an independent hospital, whether you employed providers or you used 1099s or you had independents. And in our very first year of the survey, and I'm really happy with NRHA um, for all of their support in trying to find, you know, promote it and get people to respond, we had 156 respondents. So as you saw, the largest amount of respondents for MGMA was 115 organizations for primary care. 156 hospital, um, hospitals and health systems responded to this survey. 109 of them were independent. And I think that's really reflective of what we're seeing in rural is that the independents are like, we need access to data because MGMA, we can't afford the MGMA data. We need to be able to get information to in, in, in our hands that we can actually use that's pertinent to us. And with that, okay, so how many organizations, out of that, how many physicians does that actually represent? And I say on this slide, it shows minimum physicians represented because for those of you that responded to the survey, you might recall, we asked you in a range list. We said, how many physicians does your organization have? You know, is it zero to 10, you know, 11 to 15, et cetera. And so we had you re um, respond in different buckets, right? As opposed to type in, here's exactly how many FTEs I have. So what we did is we cross-referenced every, you know, people's responses as for each organization. Here's your size of organization and here's how many physicians that represent. And so we took the minimum number of each of those ranges to come up. So we're talking about across 156 organizations, 4,234 physicians. So, I mean, that was fantastic to get that level of a response rate. And the fact that almost 3,000 of them are physicians that are at independent or um, that are at independent hospitals. Like this is really pertinent information of being like, okay, you hospitals that have been standing on your own without, without many resources, here you go. Here's a resource for, this is what is getting paid at another, for example, critical access hospital in Kansas that's standing by itself. Here's what primary care is actually getting paid for somebody that's like you, that's seeing the same types of patients as you are, that are seeing the same number of patients as you are, that it feels here that this is the compensation for the services that you actually provide. Of that, we do see a large number of physicians that are employed physicians, you know, to see that a lot of these organizations do have a significant number of W-2 employed physicians. Now, what's interesting is that looking at this, we broke it out into independent physicians, employed physicians, consulting contracted physicians, and locums. And so when I presented in person, people were asking, what is the difference between an independent physician versus a consulting or con contracted physicians? So how we had people set that up is the 1099 independent physician is supposed to be truly an independent physician versus being part of a larger like group. So where you contract with say, your emergency department is tracked with um, Emerge Trust or Team Health or something where you have a company that is providing you physicians under some sort of agreement, as opposed to here's the private practice that's in your town that you might contract with them to provide a certain amount of like call coverage or they're or they're going to you have a contract with them to come in and do hospital rounding so i wanted to point that and in addition there is um, some organizations that did provide us the information about their locums physicians on the advanced practice front um, as you can see as a minimum we have at least 1833 advanced practice providers that are represented in this again advanced practice providers being nurse practitioners physician assistants crnas and midwives. And so really important to see that the nurse practitioners, I'll get into how the breakout is between primary care and specialty. In this case though, it's not, it was not surprising to see me to see that most of the advanced practice providers are directly employed by the hospital, right? 660 um, for the independents, 428 nurse practitioners and PAs for um, that are part of a system. That is, that is typically what we do see is that more of the advanced practice providers are directly employed by the hospital. And part of that is actually, I hope, part of what we've seen in rural as far as provider recruitment of actually encouraging your registered nurses to go and pursue their nurse practitioner degree, providing them educational support and providing that as part of their compensation package of 
hey, you go become a nurse practitioner and come back and stay and work at our hospital, or you go to school in the evening and you become and you still stay part of our hospital. So it's actually helping us feed that supply chain within our um, rural hospitals. All right, we asked people to say where they're from. And so luckily we did have five out of five of the NOSOR regions. And for those of you who are not familiar with the NOSOR, which is the National Organization of State Offices of Rural Health, phenomenal resource in every state that we work with um, that has the, provides resources to their different hospitals, including student loan repayment assistance for their providers, for both nurse practitioners and physicians. And so the fact that we were able to get responses from 42 out of 50 states, whether it's an independent practice or an independent hospital that has responded, and in some instances, it was a health system that might that was responding on behalf of all of its rural organizations for what they had. A lot of good responses from the Northeast and the Midwest. Um, and so we will, as I mentioned, be providing regional um, presentations to go into the data for your specific region. I provide this map on here because for those of you who don't know which NOSOR region you are, it's not always intuitive. You know that uh, Hawaii is in the Southwest, Alaska is in the Northeast. Um, you know, and people are used to kind of seeing them as part of this Western region. But I also wanted to point this out. It is different than the MGMA geographical um, that they break out. They always have Northeast, Southeast, West, and Central. And so this is different than the MGMA. The maps look different, but this is what makes sense in our opinion for rural is to think about it aligned with what your resources are. As you will see, there are some states that are not highlighted because we didn't have respondents from them. Some of them are not surprising. Wasn't shocked to not see Rhode Island submit rural data. New Mexico, Idaho, Indiana, Virginia, we're hoping next year that you guys are will participate in the survey and get a um, have good representation from the organizations that are within your state. Um, now, without that, within that breakout, you know, Region C, as I said, our Midwestern, Midwestern region had the highest number of respondents, and they also were up there with regards to, you'll see, Region C, D, and E. So, as we move out west and in the Midwest, we have a lot higher percentage of independent respondents. We have a lot more of our standalone hospitals who are being able to provide data to us, as opposed to Regions A and B very consistent with what we actually see there where there's a lot more affiliation and consolidation that has happened. And so this breakout that we saw was really consistent with what we see as the overall compensation of the 2008 rural hospitals in the United States of, okay, regions A and B. So it, overall, we would say that the responses were really consistent with the overall makeup of what hospitals are in their different regions and how they are in the United States. Some limitations to the study. As I mentioned, we asked questions within ranges um, to get people to be make sure that they could understand, um, you know, hey, this is a survey that is actually something I can engage with. It's not getting into, a, you know, 200 questions. It's within time to be able to respond to it. We did make sure we tell people, hey, give us your actual provider employment status, base it off of FTE, the number of providers by specialty, et cetera. This was our first year, so we don't have historical data yet as far as showing trend lines. Hopefully next year will be the first time we can show those trend lines. It's also self-reported. So we didn't ask for people to actually submit their W-2s. We didn't validate any of those pieces. This is self-reported um, self data um, that we have provided um, to you guys. And let's get into the, some of the results. So the first thing I wanna talk about with regards to results is the types of compensation that was being paid because I have to say this was one of the most surprising things for me, but maybe it shouldn't have been, is out of the respondents, 56% of people who respond to the survey said, we just pay our providers on straight salary. It's here's your base salary, here's a paycheck, we don't have it tied to any sort of performance. There's no incentive compensation. There's no quality compensation. It's 100% straight salary. Now, what's concerning to me about that, besides it not being aligned with best practice, is a lot of these organizations are organizations that we see that are struggling and they haven't aligned their, the people who generate the revenue for the organization are not aligned with necessarily how revenue is generated from that organization. We see constantly within our clients that people are saying, the providers saying, I'm not sure, you know, what our goals are for this year, what we're supposed to be doing. I'm just going to go see patients and I don't have any incentive to change how I see patients, to see more patients, to see less, to have this quality outcome or that. And so when you don't have compensation aligned with what an organization is trying to achieve 
and you do this straight salary, it is something that we see is going to um, impact the overall performance of that organization. It is going to suffer, right? However, at least 37% of respondents said, hey, we do provide some sort of incentive compensation. The biggest thing that we saw, 30.6% of organizations are doing something with work RVUs. That is what we see as the most standard out in the industry. So I'm glad to see that rural is saying, all right, work RVUs are something that we can measure. It's set by CMS. It's not up for debate as to how to define a work RVU. Paying on that, usually if you're sending out your bills, you should be able to calculate the work RVUs, right, to figure out for your organization. So it's something that is definitely measurable that physicians and nurse practitioners and PAs can understand and say, okay, if you incentivize me based off of my work RVUs, I understand I, it gets simple compensation. I can do the math. I know what I'm going to get paid. I will say, though, it is very set in a fee-for-service mindset. So if you are thinking about moving towards value-based payments and controlling the cost of care and thinking about that kind of reimbursement, work RVUs can only be a portion of it because it is very fee-for-service driven. It's great to actually see 22.2% of organizations that do provide incentive compensation paying on quality, right? I will say what I typically see is an organization saying, here's a quality stipend. If you hit these three metrics, here's $10,000, right? Or here's an additional 10% increase in compensation. A lot of what we're seeing is people is paying, um, did you get patient satisfaction? Based on your press gainy score is X, all right, here's your quality stipend. Net collections is still in existence in rural, which was a little bit surprising given how that has waned out. But I did like to see that it says a lot about role that we are looking at patient encounters and visits because primary care, that is something that we're seeing an increase into is saying, hey, let's look at your actual patient encounters. How many visits are you doing? And especially for those of you who that have rural health clinics, doing it based off of visits or specifically um, RHC qualifying visits is a great way to compensate providers in a way that is aligned to make sure you hit your minimum productivity threshold so you don't have a rate, um, your all-inclusive rate slashed, um, you know, and that you can, and then it makes sure that the organ, um, the providers within that RHC understand what is an RHC qualifying visit. How do I structure this visit to make sure that it's, it's worth that all-inclusive rate and that the patient's getting what they need out of it. Additional forms of compensation, out of the 156 respondents, 125 said, we do provide a relocation stipend, most of which are at least $5,000, and that 121 respondents out of the 156 are paying student loan repayment. Now, one of the things that we got the feedback that we will be changing for next year is who is paying that student loan repayment, given our wonderful state offices of rural health that are helping us out with some of that student loan repayment is, how much of that is the burden of the hospital versus is it getting paid by some additional organization? We did ask hospitals in your instructions, we said, what are you paying? So my presumption, but we're gonna clarify it for next year, my presumption is that this amount of money is being directly paid by the hospital as part of an incentive for providers to come in. And most of them are actually paying less than $45,000 per provider per year. And so, that being the case, oftentimes what I'm seeing out in, urban, um, in the MGMA data is that the compensation student loan repayments for physicians is well over $100,000 and very little to no student loan repayments for nurse practitioners. Rural is ahead of the game as far as recognizing nurse practitioners and physician assistants and CRNAs are also interested in student loan repayments, but, pay, but may not be paying physicians quite as much on that student loan repayment because they might be relying on a provider qualifying for um, student loan forgiveness through a federal program. Um, a, few, a lot fewer respondents actually say that they were providing sign-on bonuses. Only 91 respondents say that they're providing a sign-on bonus, and over half of them were paying less than $5,000 in sign-on per provider. So this is substantially less than what we were seeing in the other publicly available data, right? We were typically seeing sign-on bonuses for a provider um, uh, you know, well north of $10,000. We are seeing physician sign-on bonuses equal to about 10% of their pay. So if you think about it, if you had a specialist who's making $400,000, their sign-on bonus might be $40,000. Uh, $40, and so to see that in rural, we're paying, you know, 58% of our organizations are paying less than $5,000 a sign-on bonus per provider, you know, on the one hand, maybe we're not overpaying, but you have to think about how you structure your compensation where a sign-on bonus can be structured in an at-risk, 
hey, you're going to fulfill the entire term of your contract or you're going to have to pay that sign-on bonus back of how much do we put in this 56% of people paying straight salary versus can we pay a little bit less on the straight salary and put more on a sign-on bonus um, to be, you know, have competitive compensation. So very interesting results from this survey. All right, let's get into primary care. So primary care out of our 156 respondents, you know, all of, all of them that responded had primary care providers that they were responding for. So nobody was responding of, hey, I just, all I have is a specialist and that's all um, that I employ. And what was interesting to me is it wasn't too long ago that median compensation for family medicine physicians was about 240,000, right? That was considered, hey, average, that's what you kind of expected to come in. Now, given that was pre-pandemic numbers, and that was also before the significant CMS physician fee schedule changes that greatly, greatly increased the value of primary care on a work RVU basis. They said, we got to give credit to primary care for what they do. And so when we ran this survey, looking at this, family medicine providers with OB and without OB, the fact that, okay, we're still staying under, with, with OB, we were still staying under that 400,000 mark, right? And actually the majority of our physicians are still making less than $260,000 per year, right? However, when you move on to the, the without OB side, it was very interesting to me, all right, we're starting to see 17.7% of providers are making over $300,000 our family medicine providers are getting into that from a primary care basis. Now, again, it's you got to think about how you structure that compensation as to what is the provider doing for that? What is the panel that they're managing? And what is, what is the incentive? Because I have to say, it is a little bit concerning to me from a return on investment if we're going to pay over $300,000 on a straight salary right? Here's, here's your check for $300,000. Because that, what's interesting about that is that these amounts that we're seeing are actually greater than what we were seeing in the MGMA data, right? So rural is having to pay a higher premium for family medicine. Probably not, shouldn't be too surprising because we ask so much of our primary care physicians um, for the services that they're, that they're providing. However, you know, as long as that compensation is tied to what the services that they're providing in a way that's meaningful, you know, paying that this much shouldn't be that surprising, but that number is going to keep on getting ratcheted up the more that we ask of them. And as the data becomes available to primary care physicians, they're going to start making one in compensation similar to that of the level of a specialist as the ones who are managing the care. Now, looking at the nurse practitioners, right, this is primary care APPs, the nurse practitioners with and without OB. With OB on that side of things, we're seeing a good spread of um, nurse practitioners. However, the majority of them are making less than $150,000 a year, regardless of what their state is of licensure. So if they're in a restricted practice state versus a full practice state where they can access that full scope of license, they're still making less than $150,000 per year. Now, where this number is um, particularly of interest to me is because we have started seeing more and more nurse practitioners in the past two years revert back to actually, you know what, I'm just going to practice as an RN. And on top of that, I'm going to go be a contract nurse because that $150,000 per year is translating to $72 per hour, as opposed to Coffin Hall did a, um, a survey with regards to nursing staff and contract nurses were averaging last year $132 per hour. So I've been in organizations that said, why on earth would I do would be a nurse practitioner managing a full panel of patients in this prior, in this rural health clinic when I can go be a contract nurse and make $132 per hour, right? Because what's interesting is even though the nurse practitioners over the past 10 years have started to be paid similar to physicians, because of what's been going on with contract nurses, they've started thinking about their compensation more aligned with that cost per hour, right? $72 per hour versus, a you know, can I make $90 per hour versus $130 per hour, as opposed to here's my all in salary, which again, if you're paying your nurse practitioner similar to a physician where they have incentive compensation, it can be uncapped. A nurse practitioner, you see 8% were making greater than $208,000 per year. So as a nurse practitioner, there was a time where paying them over 100,000 was crazy to imagine we're seeing them making over 200,000 in situations where they're uncapped in compensation. They can make, the more patients they see, the more services they provide, 
the more money they, they can make. As opposed to a contract nurse, it usually is there is some there is an upper limit of what they can make. So let's break this out into regions a little bit for the starting out with the physicians um, without OB. So I provided the NOSOR map on here for people to be able to kind of see how this broke out. Is we see in regions A and B, 100% of our providers in those regions that responded are paying less than 234,000. So again, regions A and B, because this might be difficult for you, read, you to read, regions A and B are over here in the Southeast and the Northeast, this Eastern part of the United States, we're making less than 234,000. Now, if you, if you shift over to region C, which is here over here in the Midwest, you're start being able to make a little bit more, um, more money. And we're seeing those physicians with OB that are, you know, 30% of them are making over 300 and up to 377. Region D up here in my uh, my Rocky Mountains and then northern um, central plain, Great Plains, you know, it's kind of split it pretty evenly, a third, a third, a third of respondents and where they're making. But um, it's one of those things that if I'm, you know, as I said, I'm based here in Tennessee. If I know I'm going to be making less than two hundred and thirty thousand dollars over here in this state and right over here in Missouri, I can cross over into Missouri and be making, you know, three hundred thousand dollars versus 234, you've got to think about it from your competitive standpoint. Now, Region E, I will say um, the respondents that we have over here, we had some respondents in Hawaii that had a very, very high cost of living. So I am going to point out that where we did have primary care providers making over 377, just you know, between California and Hawaii, I will say I dug into that data to validate in Texas. I'm not seeing those numbers in Texas. Those that 377,000 people, those happen to be in the California and, and Hawaii areas. Now we look at primary care um, physicians with OB, which I think is going to be really important when you think about our maternal health deserts. And so thinking about that, we were expecting to see some of the states that had very large maternal health deserts paying primary care physicians with OB more to try to create maternal health access. We did not, but that was not how it turned out, right? That was what was our hypothesis that we would see in the data that has not been the case. And so um, we have a lot, very large maternal health deserts here in the Southeast, but we still are paying primary care physicians with OB the least amount here in the East, so less than 260,000. Again, um, in our regions C and in region E over here, so our, our plant, Great Plains, Midwest, and also down in here in Texas, all the way across to California. That's where we're seeing primary care physicians with OB making in the $400,000 range, right? Making over $390,000 in those two regions. So definitely a lot more compensation in those areas. Not necessarily higher reimbursement either, by the way. Um, I didn't mention the restricted practice states. So as somebody who lives in Tennessee, as you can see is bright red, a very, very restricted practice state, compensation was also very interesting to see how did that play out. So region B, the Southeast, had all of our respondents, as you can see that Southeastern part of the United States is all in restricted or reduced practice state for nurse practitioners and PAs. They can't use the full scope of their license. There are very strict state laws about what, the, what those um, providers can do. And so what's interesting to me is they also had, when we looked at those respondents that are in there, when I shift over onto the next slide, they also had lower compensation. So over here, as we were talking about on the physician side of things, the nurse practitioners also have low compensation. So I want you guys to be able to see this map and have it in your mind as I go to the next couple of slides, because I think you need to keep it in mind for the competitiveness of your compensation. If you are in a restricted practice state or a reduced practice state that is paying lower and you are right next door to say, if you're in Oklahoma and you're right near there near Kansas, and in Kansas they can practice their full license and make more money, that's going to be very appealing for those nurse practitioners um, to be able to stay in practicing as a nurse practitioner rather than reverting back to an RN and where they might want to actually go and practice for that competitive compensation. So again, as I said, are we Southeast? Very, very restricted practice state. So getting over here, region B. Look, all of our nurse practitioners may are making less than $156,000. The further west I move in into the Midwest, 
you start seeing more and more providers, 25, you know, over 30% of our providers are making over 150,000 when I get into these areas where I can practice at a greater sense of my license, right? And so really being able to align that scope of services, region C and D, so our Northeast and our Great Plains um, Central Midwest, we have that, so those are the two areas where we were seeing nurse practitioners making over $200,000 um, per year. On the nurse practitioners with OB, again, this was an area where we thought it would align with the maternal health deserts and, and making more where the, uh, a lot of those deserts existed. That, it, that wasn't the case in this, in this situation. Again, region B being the region that compensates the lowest amount. And again, a all of them making under $150,000 per year. And then you move over a little bit of region A. So in New England, we do have a few providers who are making over 150,000, but it's not until well, you're out into the Midwest and the Western part of the United States where we're seeing them making over $170,000 per year as a nurse practitioner with the ability to provide some OB services. Getting into the physician assistants. Now, one of the things I want to point out about the physician assistants is that what we've seen in rural is while in urban areas, they might make a more of a big distinction between a nurse practitioner and a physician assistant. In rural areas, what we have seen when we compare this data is that a lot of organizations are saying, here's the job. I don't care what your license is between nurse practitioner or PA. It's the same job. We're going to pay you the same amount, right? So while these numbers are a little bit lower on the physician assistant side, rather than on the nurse practitioner side, we are seeing the same exact same trends that we were seeing as far as the regional breakout, with the exception of the of New England, where we did see more of the PAs making in the ones, you know, 5% of them making between 170 and 188,000 um, dollars per year. But that overall line, and that's something that's unique to rural as far as treating nurse practitioners and PAs the same. On the with OB side, this is where again, region, region B, lowest paying region, regions A actually did get into that highest bucket for the PAs of making up to 100, um, 170,000. What's interesting is that we did have some, um, in New England, the PAs are able to make more in region A than in region C and D. All right, I know I'm, I'm getting close to where we need to get to Q&A. So I wanna go over some of the things that we found in specialty care, especially because of what it said to me about the difference between being an independent hospital versus being part of a system and what access that you have. So a lot of times we assume as an independent um, hospital, you're going to use a lot of professional services agreements in order to have access to specialists. You don't employ them. You're hoping you're um, relying on a larger tertiary system to be able to provide that. So across the region, it was actually a different regions. It was pretty even except for region C in our Midwestern states um, and Northern um, Central United States. The majority, there are actually a lot more organizations that actually rely on professional services agreements with organ, um, hospitals and larger systems to give them access to providers. What I thought was very interesting was though, how many people had no idea, right? Like we're like, here's what a professional services agreement, like I can't find it. I have no idea how we're having access to this provider, how we're necessarily paying them, um, you know, but I have, I have these specialists, I have access to them but I don't know what agreement we have in place with them. That's not terribly surprising given the fact that I've been in a hospital in Texas where they couldn't find a single one of their provider contracts that they'd had in place. Most of things were done via handshake deal with the CEO 20 years ago, and they hadn't really you know, brought in very many new providers until the pandemic. And then they were just now being like, oh, we should get some contracts into place. So those things happen in rural and they happen more in the independent hospitals than they do happen in the systems. So when I broke this out between independents and those that are system affiliated, you know, those that are independent, as we said, have a much higher relate, um, re, uh, reliance on having a professional service agreement to get access to a lot of these specialists, right? In order to be able to have orthopedics, to have cardiology, I have to have some sort of professional services agreement in place. What I have to say is very concerning is those that are part of a system, a hospital system, not knowing whether or not they had contracts. That was supposed to be one of the benefits of being part of a system was having somebody who 
there's a larger corporate office or admin group that is supposed to be taking care of this stuff, making sure it is very templated, that you know things are being consistent. Hey, you provide me the providers, here's how we're paying for it. And the number of them that are like, we don't know, what we're not sure. We have no idea whether or not we have professional services agreements in place. General surgery is the number one specialty that we do get special um, professional services agreements from. Um, and not surprising that radiology and anesthesiology are also really high up on there for getting access to. Same with psychiatry, some of this stuff is really being provided via telehealth um, to be able to have that kind of access to them. So regardless of your affiliation status, a lot of them are, these are the areas that you're having to use a professional services agreement rather than being able to employ um, these physicians. Now, what I also found interesting that is consistent with what we see out there in the market, only 21 of the all respondents had any access to psychiatric care, right? Regardless of whether or not it was a PSA or whether or through it was employment, only 21% out of, or 21 out of 156 respondents have that kind of access to psychiatrists as their behavioral health uh, modality of choice. And so that's really concerning given um, what we're seeing as far as the cost for psychiatry that are going on in there and the lack of behavioral health access. Um, this is just a breakout and because I, I know we need to get to questions between the independents and um, the systems as far as who, who are they using systems. It's not surprising that radiology and anesthesiology were higher up because they do have a tendency to work with large national organizations to, to provide their radiology and their anesthesiology services. So getting into the actual numbers in rural or anesthesiology compensation, we are keeping it under the MGMA median, you know, right at, um, or right around the MGMA median of about 500,000. We're paying, we're making all of our hospitals, we're paying less than $520,000 for the anesthesiology physician. So that part wasn't going up substantially in comparison. Same with neurology, all we were um, paying at, we're paying less than 422,000. Right now the MGMA median is 347. So a little bit higher than the MGMA median, but at least we're not getting well above that 75th and 90th percentile um, range that people were thinking that in rural we're constantly to get access to specialty we have to be paying in that 75th 90th percentiles of MGMA and so the last thing I want to touch on because I know we need to get to questions is on the anesthesiology in rural we wanted to make sure we got data specifically about the CRNAs a lot of our hospitals that we work with rely on CRNAs and I that is one of the things that I've actually been engaged with the most the past couple of years is what should we be paying our CRNAs there's a lot of data out there from their larger publications but not specific to rural right of just saying here's what CRNAs are making and so we've seen this number grow substantially over re, um, the past um, few years. It used to sit typically at around $150,000 on the employed basis. And now over half or almost half of our CRNAs are making over $188,000. So that's something that I think is very much um, indicative of the pandemic, which is interesting considering CRNAs from a supply and demand. If you go out to um, the different, um, the um, AMA out there, they say CRNAs is one of the only things we don't currently have a shortage of. However, their compensation has grown substantially over recent years. You, we, ha we can get CRNAs, but they're costing us a ton of money and there doesn't seem to be as so much of a shortage. The fact that we have CRNAs that are under a contract basis, so supposed to be all inclusive of, hey, under a PSA, that amount is supposed to include the benefits cost. Um, as well as the, the direct compensation of over 300,000, right? Over 338,000 in that CNR, CRNA space. So it's getting really expensive to run our ORs but, um, than it was previously. However, there are a few areas that, you know, 25% of the, on the employed side are still making less than 110,000. Now, I will say those that are making less than 110,000 typically do have access to a physician anesthesiologist is when we dug into the data. So I did want to put that antidote out there. Um, now, what's next, right? Since we're getting to the end here, we are going to be doing regional surveys to dive into the actual specific regional data um, that we have so that you can see that breakout based off of what NOSOR region that you guys are in. Um, we here, you know, here's the webinar. We are going to be sending out these slides we are putting this into a larger, hey, here's the white paper of getting into the details, especially around the different specialties. 
there's some questions that have already been requested um, for people for next year, which is which is really encouraging of people saying, hey, if you ask this question, I want the answer to it, so I will respond to it. We do ask that if you are interested in participating in the survey or if you have feedback of, hey, I want to participate and I never even heard about it, or I, you know, these are this is information that I need. Next year we plan on doing a compensation survey only again, focus on compensation. And um, by 2025, we're hoping to expand to both compensation and productivity so we can line up, hey, $234,000 for a primary care physician, that physician is seeing 13 patients per day. $300,000 primary care physician is seeing 27 patients per day so that we can line up that information. So with that, I realize I did not leave the 15 minutes, Cody. I apologize, but questions. It's okay. You had such great information. I'm sure everyone appreciated it. We do have a lot of questions that came in, and I just want to state that um, if we don't get to your question, because we most likely won't before the time is up, the team will receive every one of these questions, and they can reach out and make sure that you get your answer and any information that you're looking for. Also, a lot of requests for the recording and slides. Recording will be sent out today, and slide decks, um, I will make sure the team has your requests, and they will work with you to make sure that you have all the information that you need. So no worries there, everybody. Um, let's just dive in really fast. In terms of telemedicine, how frequently are physicians being paid for wholly telemedicine practices at the same rate as if they were on site or in person? So we did not ask that question in the survey, so I'm going to mention that anecdotally based off of what I see. I actually see that actually very low numbers um, because most of the telemedicine physicians that I'm seeing that are directly employed by a telemedicine company are actually paid on a different type of model of an efficiency click rate versus what they're actually receiving if they were on um, on site directly paid by the hospital rather than through a telemedicine company. The caveat I say of that is if your telemedicine is provided by a larger tertiary system and so they're you know like say I'm in, um, in Iowa and I'm using Unity Point and they're providing me um, a telemedicine provider of somebody that they employ that works certain telemedicine shifts then in that case, if it is a provider who is normally in person, but doing telemedicine shifts for a rural hospital that is part of a system, then they are paid um, about the same, they're paid the same amount as in person because they're trying to incentivize that provider to take those telemedicine shifts. Great, thank you. The next question um, regarding medical uh, directorship is the median stipend of 25,000, is that yearly? Yes. Perfect, thank you. Um, did Please, any don't pay that <laughs> Please don't pay that quarterly. Did any organization show a collection-based bonus structure? Um, yes, so as, and then I'll, I'll flip back to it, but I think 10% of our organizations said that they were paying as a percentage of net collections. And again, that's 10% of the 37% that said that they're providing incentive compensation. 10% are still doing that net collections as part of their incentive compensation. Great. I just had, I don't know, three or four questions come in. I'm going to address them really fast. It says, how do I participate in next year's survey? I think Opal pointed it out, but I will also point it out. There is a survey that will be at the end of this webinar. The There is a question in there that asks if you want to participate. All you have to do is supply your email address and we'll take care of the rest. Okay. When yep. you discuss compensation, are you speaking about all compensation, which would include benefits such as vacation, insurance, malpractice, et cetera? Okay. No, we are talking cash compensation. Box five of your W-2, box three of your K-1, it is actual like gross, um, gross, gross compensation is not inclusive of actual benefits part of remuneration. So that is a great question. It is cash, what is considered cash compensation. And I, I have to say that, you know, that, that cash compensation can be misleading because people sometimes pay their student loan repayment directly to the loan provider rather than the physician, so they don't think of that as cash compensation. It is defined by the IRS as cash compensation. And sorry, Cody, this wasn't asked, um, but the person who asked about participating in the survey, by the way, the survey is free. The results are free. Unlike others, you do, by the way, so anybody who wants the answers to the survey, if you responded to it, if you provided your email address when you did the survey, you are getting the survey will be sent to you directly. You do not have to pay for it. I just awesome. wanted to put that out there. Yeah, absolutely. Any thoughts on doing the survey, splitting out um, the CAHs from all other rules? Um, yes, actually, that is the question that we are adding for next year is to actually specifically break out the CHs. 
All right, this was a very popular one. Why are there states that aren't represented? <laughs> okay, because they didn't have any respondents. Um, so a lot of, if I go back to this, the, where we have the little dots that are showing kind of the respondents and their geographic spread. And so the states, the, the eight states that didn't respond, I will say Rhode Island, um, Connecticut, not surprising, they don't have very many rural hospitals um, in there. But the states that are definitely rural, Idaho, my home state, New Mexico and Indiana, Virginia, et cetera, we actually are going to do targeted outreach to those states because there, we asked um, those ones, we probably didn't have the same relationship with the state office of rural health to get them as involved to try to please ask their um, people in their state to actually respond to the survey. So, Great, thank you. I have one more Hopefully question next and then we'll close out. Um, this is more about, I think, terminology. What is a primary care NP with OB? Is that a midwife? No, it is not a midwife. Um, th th great question. So in, it is primary care with OB is defined as a nurse practitioner or a physician assistant that has licensing in being able to provide additional women's health OB services. I can make sure, Cody, when we send out, I'll give the full definition of that into um, of like, well, here are the OB services that you have to be able to provide. It's, so it's, I should have apologized for anybody who thought it was a midwife. Okay, wonderful. Um, I, it is three o'clock, so I'm going to have to close this out. Again, everyone, I will make sure that Opal gets all of the questions and she, her and her team can reach out and make sure that you have the information you need. There's also that ability to um, complete the survey at the end that will allow you to take next year's survey. And uh, thank you everyone for joining us today. I know that you all found this webinar informative and engaging because I've received all of the comments. Um, so I appreciate your feedback. Opal, we really appreciate your time and the knowledge that you shared with us today. Um, as a reminder, there will be a recording sent out later today. Before you leave, please take a moment to complete that survey. Um, your, your insights guide us in our future educational series. So everyone, please have a great day, and we look forward to seeing you at our next event. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Cody. Thank you.